The Emperor Wears No Clothes, written by Jack Herer, narrated by Lex Thompson for the Cannabis for Black People Book Club. Chapter 5, Marijuana Prohibition. Ainslinger got his marijuana law. Should we believe self-serving, ever-growing, drug enforcement, drug treatment bureaucrats whose pay and advancement depends on finding more and more people to arrest and treat? More Americans die in just one day in prisons, penitentiaries, jails, and stockades than have ever died from marijuana throughout history. Who are they protecting? From what? Fred Orther, MD, Portland, Oregon. Moving to Crush Dissent. After the 1938 to 1944 New York City LaGuardia Marijuana Report refuted his argument by reporting that marijuana caused no violence at all and citing other positive results. Harry J. Ainslinger, in public tirade after tirade, denounced Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, the New York Academy of Medicine, and the doctors who researched the report. Ainslinger proclaimed that these doctors would never again do marijuana experiments or research without his personal permission or be sent to jail. He then used the full power of the United States government illegally to halt virtually all research into marijuana while he blackmailed the American Medical Association into denouncing the New York Academy of Medicine and its doctors for the research they had done. Why, you ask, was the AMA now on Anslinger's side in 1944 to 1945? after being against the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937? Answer. Since Ainslinger's FBN was responsible for prosecuting doctors who prescribed narcotic drugs for what he, Ainslinger, deemed illegal purposes, they, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, had prosecuted more than 3,000 AMA doctors for illegal prescriptions through 1939. In 1939, the AMA made specific peace with Ainslinger on marijuana. The results? Only three doctors were prosecuted for illegal drugs of any sort from 1939 to 1949. To refute the LaGuardia report, the AMA, at Ainslinger's personal request, conducted a 1944-45 to study. Of the experimental group, 34 were Negroes and one was white for statistical control, who smoked marijuana, became disrespectful of white soldiers and officers in the segregated military. This technique of biasing the outcome of a study is known among researchers as gutter science. Pot and the threat of peace. However, from 1948 to 1950, Ainslinger stopped feeding the press the story that marijuana was violence causing and began red baiting typical of the McCarthy era. Now the frightened American public was told that this was a much more dangerous drug than he originally thought. Testifying before a strongly anti-communist Congress in 1948 and thereafter continually to the press, Ainslinger proclaimed that marijuana rendered, rendered its users not violent at all, but so peaceful and pacifistic that the communists could and would use marijuana to weaken our American fighting men's will to fight. This was a 180 degree turnaround of the original pretext on which violence causing cannabis was outlawed in 1937. Undaunted, however, Congress now voted to continue the marijuana law based on the exact opposite reasoning they had used to outlaw cannabis in the first place. It is interesting and even absurd to note that Ainslinger and his biggest supporters, Southern Congressman and his best senatorial friend, Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin, from 1948 on, constantly received press coverage on the scare. According to Ainslinger's autobiographical book, The Murderers, and confirmed by former Federal Bureau of Narcotics agents, Ainslinger had been supplying morphine illegally to a U.S. Senator, Joseph McCarthy, for years. The reason given by Ainslinger in his book? 
So the communists would not be able to blackmail this great American senator for his drug dependency weakness. Ainslinger told Congress the communists would sell marijuana to American boys to sap their will to fight, to make us a nation of zombie pacifists. Of course, the communists of Russia and China ridiculed this U.S. marijuana paranoia every chance they got, in the press and at the United Nations. Unfortunately, the idea of pot and pacifism got so much sensational world press for the next 20 years that eventually Russia, China, and the Eastern Bloc communist countries that grew large amounts of cannabis outlawed marijuana for the fear that America would sell it or use it to make the communist soldiers docile and pacifistic. This was strange because Russia, Eastern Europe, and China had been growing and ingesting cannabis as a medical drug, relaxant, and work tonic for hundreds and even thousands of years with no thought of marijuana laws. The JB Dialogue Soviet Press Digest in October of 1990 reported a flourishing illegal hemp business despite the frantic efforts by Soviet law enforcement agencies to stamp it out. In Kyrgyzia alone, hemp plantations occupy some 3,000 hectares. In another area, Russians are traveling three days into one of the more sinister places in the Moin Kumi Desert to harvest a special high-grade, drought-resistant variety of hemp known locally as Anasha. A secret program to control minds and choices. Through a report released in 1983 under the Freedom of Information Act, it was discovered after 40 years of secrecy that Ainslinger was appointed in 1942 to a top secret committee to create a truth serum for the Office of Strategic Service, which evolved into the Central Intelligence Agency. Ainslinger and his spy group picked as America's first truth serum, honey oil, a much purer, almost tasteless form of hash oil to be administered in food to spies, saboteurs, military prisoners, and the like to make them unwittingly spill the truth. 15 months later, in 1943, marijuana extracts were discontinued by Ainslinger's group as America's first truth serum because it was noted that they didn't work all the time. The people being interrogated would often giggle or laugh hysterically at their captors, get paranoid, or have insatiable desires for food, the munchies. Also, the report noted that American OSS agents and other interrogation groups started using the honey oil illegally themselves and would not give it to the spies. In Ainslinger's OSS groups, final report on marijuana as a truth serum, there was no mention of violence caused by the drug. In fact, the opposite was indicated. The OSS and later the CIA continued the search and tried other drugs as truth serum, psilocybin or Amanita muscaria mushrooms, and LSD to name a few. For 20 years, the CIA secretly tested these concoctions on American agents unsuspecting subjects jumped from buildings or thought they'd gone insane. Our government finally admitted doing all of this to its own people in the 1970s, after 25 years of denials, drugging innocent, non-consenting, unaware citizens, soldiers, and government agents, all in the name of national security, of course. These American security agencies constantly threatened and even occasionally imprisoned individuals, families, and organizations that suggested the druggings had ever occurred. It was three decades before the Freedom of Information Act forced the CIA to admit its lies through exposure on TV by CBS's 60 Minutes and others. However, on April 16, 1985, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the CIA did not have to reveal the identities of either the individuals or institutions involved in this travesty. 
the court said, in effect, that the CIA could decide what was or was not to be released under the Freedom of Information Act, and that the courts could not overrule the agency's decision. As an aside, repealing this Freedom of Information Act was one of the prime goals of the Reagan, Bush, and Quayle administrations. Criminal Misconduct Before Ainslinger started the pacifist zombie marijuana scare in 1948, he publicly used jazz music, violence, and the gore files for five to seven more years from 1943 to 1950 in the press, at conventions, lectures, and congressional hearings. We now know that on the subject of hemp disguised as marijuana, Ainslinger was a bureaucratic police liar. For more than 70 years now, Americans have been growing up with and accepting Ainslinger's statements on the herb, from violence to evil pacifism, and finally, to the corrupting influence of music. Whether this was economically or racially inspired, or even because of upbeat music or some kind of synergistic hysteria, is impossible to know for sure. But we do know that for the U.S. government, DEA, information disseminated on cannabis was then and continues to be a deliberate deception. As you will see in the following chapters, the weight of empirical fact and large amounts of corroborating evidence indicate that the former Reagan, Bush, Quayle administrations, along with their unique pharmaceutical connections, have probably conspired at the highest levels to withhold information and to disinform the public, resulting in the avoidable and needless deaths of tens of thousands of Americans. And they did it, it seems, intending to save their own investment and their friends in the pharmaceutical, energy, and paper industries, and to give these poisonous, synthetic industries an insane advantage over natural hemp and protect the billions of dollars in annual profits that they stood to lose if the hemp plant and marijuana were not prohibited. As a result, millions of Americans have wasted millions of years in jail time and millions of lives have been and continue to be ruined by what started out as Hearst's, Ainslinger's, and DuPont's shameful economic lies, vicious racial libels, and bigoted musical taste.